down the Holy Ghost so that we might be connected with God, that we might be forgiven of our sins and receive this wonderful new life. Praise the Lord. And that's probably a pretty good summary of what it's all about. But let's open up the Bible because I do want to share a few scriptures with you. Great to hear these testimonies, of course. Um, I happened to be reading through some Papua New Guinea testimonies the other day and uh, just, just reminded me of there's nothing too difficult for God. Nothing. Um, Pastor Godfrey up in Papua New Guinea, he's actually originally an, a journalist by profession and he will take cases of recent healings down to the local TV stations and ask them to interview the people that were healed to try and get some more traction off it. Uh, I remember recently he took two AIDS victims who were healed by the power of God down to the local TV station and they refused to interview them. They just point blank refuse. It's just not, it's kind of not worth their while slash it's a bit hard to believe, whatever. Um, in some cases, I remember meeting a fellow in uh, Port Moresby who was, um, uh, he was an, uh, an engineer, he was a, a native, but he was an engineer, mechanical engineer, I think, worked on an Australian gold mine up in the middle of Papua New Guinea. And uh, he just uh, calmly said to me, oh, well, uh, I caught AIDS back in such and such. Uh, my wife contracted it from me. My two daughters contracted it from us. And the three of them died. And I was the last one standing. He said, I've got blood results every three months because working for an Australian company, they had to have regular medical checkups and so forth. And he said, uh, I was on my way out. He said, I, everybody knew I was on my way out. My family had died, one thing or another. And he said, I heard the message of the gospel and I repented, got baptised, got filled with the Spirit. And he said, I was instantly healed by the power of God. And he said, I, I got my blood results, the next one that came back. And he said, it was just all gone. And uh, to sort of stand and talk to this man in front of you. And I, and I said, oh, okay, did life move on? He said, yeah, I remarried. I said, I got, I got, he said, I got another, I think it was three kids or something or other. So God does wonderful things. Matthew 24, if you will. Matthew 24. As I look around the world at the moment, though, um, I guess what uh, strikes me is the craziness of the world and the, the way in which the world does feel ever more unstable and does remind me very much of scriptures in the Bible about the return of Jesus Christ. Now, whenever I talk about a topic like this, people sometimes say, well, are you saying Jesus is coming back like next Tuesday or something? And I say, no, he might be back Monday. But he might also not be back for another 500 years. I don't know. But when I look around at the world, so much of the world does uh, seem to be depicted in prophecy messages of the Bible. And to me, it looks like about the right time. And uh, so forgive me, if you will, as I just present a few more prophecy verses for you this morning. Um, and I want to base it on one particular theme, which I'll talk about in a moment. But let's just get into this story. Uh, if you read the words of Jesus Christ, there are actually three chapters which are solid prophetic material. Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. There's other bits and pieces here and there, but three solid chapters that Jesus gave us. I, by my estimate, maybe a quarter to a third of the whole Bible is prophetic. By my estimate, you can challenge that. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. There are some entire books which are prophetic. Uh, try reading the book of Ezekiel <laughs> into, uh, as a novel. You'll find that very, very difficult. Uh, what is it, 44 chapters? I've forgotten now. Whatever it is, anyway. But all prophecy. The book of Isaiah, exactly the same. Uh, they're Old Testament books, let alone the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament, such books as the book of Revelation. Try reading the book of Revelation like a newspaper. Good luck with that. It's all prophetic from almost the first uh, verse to the very last verse in chapter 22. Um, and in Matthew 24, as I say, there's a fair bit of prophetic material here. I'm not going to comment too much because, as I say, I do want to get to a little theme here. But verse 1, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, back in Bible days, to walk into Jerusalem was, it looked, particularly the temple region, luxurious. 
luxurious. The original temple was a building which was completely coated in gold leaf. Gold leaf from one end of the building to the other, internally right through the uh, various, uh, you'll see other passages here, various parts of the decorations included precious stones all across the various sections, carvings and what have you, a big, huge colonnaded area in the, what's known as Herod's Temple and so forth. So Jesus is sitting there saying, guys, you see this amazing structure? Very shortly, the entire thing is going to be pulled down to the ground. Not one stone left upon another. And even in cases of perhaps a war, you don't often get an army coming in and deciding that they're going to rip a building apart stone by stone. How about though, if the gold melts as the building is burnt down between the stones? That's a fairly good incentive, isn't it? And that apparently, historically they say, is what probably happened. Uh, verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And I just want to point out that when we talk about Bible prophecy and so forth, uh, many, many folk will often say to me, and they've maybe spent decades in churches, you know, there were, there were I think it was Eddie, were you a good Church of England or something? But you were Church of England, but you just weren't good. Is that what you're saying? Okay, right. He's going, meaning he was Church of England, but he wasn't a good one. Um, others spent decades perhaps in uh, Baptist churches or Churches of Christ or perhaps, you know, Roman Catholic churches, whatever it happens to be. And they have no idea that in the Bible there's a scripture that says there's going to be an end of the world. Maybe deep down they kind of feel that might be going to happen, but they don't realise the concept actually comes from the words of the Bible, because there is. So they asked him those couple of questions. They're actually slightly different, but I won't talk about that today. Um, Jesus goes on, verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man shall deceive you, for many shall come in my name, that is, in the name of Jesus Christ, they shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, in other words, saying, Jesus is Christ, and shall deceive many. In other words, there'll be false Christianity all over the world, people claiming that they're followers of Jesus Christ, uh, but they're actually not true Bible Christians, which seems a bit strange. Maybe back for the early apostles here, the concept was hard to grasp. Today, you and I look around the world where there are supposedly two and a bit mi billion Christians on the face of the earth, and most of us would sort of you know, find that hard to believe. There's just so many different views and beliefs and what have you, different competing ideas. And Jesus said, that's right, watch out. The first big sign of the end is a great spread of nominal Christianity, which we certainly have today. But he goes on and gives other warnings in verse 5. Uh, verse 6, you shall hear of wars and rumours of wars or, or uh, threats of war. Uh, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Um, and he describes here massive uh, natural disasters. Uh, I mean, we think of earthquakes and so on, famines. Uh, pestilences, of course. I mean, we've spent, you know, the better part of three years trying to get on top of the COVID disaster that has changed the world as we know it. Uh, and now they've got, got us war warning about further, you know, of coronaviruses as well as maybe other bugs around the place that don't sound too pleasant, monkeypox and so on, all these other things that are happening out there. And Jesus said, well, okay, if you feel that that's what's happening, then look out, you might be near the end of the world. But the story goes on, and I'm going to pick it up again in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. Uh, and uh, the gospel, of course, is being preached all over the world in many strange places. Uh, and then the end shall come. He goes on, though, down in verse 25. Verse 25. Read the whole chapter later at your leisure. Behold, I have told you before. Jesus makes that statement on several different occasions. 
uh, just letting us know. He says, look, stuff's going to happen, and whether it's end of the world stuff or maybe receiving the Holy Spirit stuff. And then he tacks onto it, I'm telling you this in advance. I'm warning you about this ahead of time. Why? So that when it happens, you'll look back and you'll be able to say, well, I was one of the few people that knew that that was going to happen because I heard Jesus say it was going to happen. And as I say, there's quite a few of these. Behold, I tell you before, I'm letting you know in advance, you'll be prepared. A little further down again, verse 30. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So the end of the world, the end of the age, uh, Jesus Christ comes from heaven with angels, with the power of God to surround the entire earth. We know elsewhere the Bible says at that moment the true Christians will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, raised up to be with the Lord in the air, joined with him in one body, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It says mortals shall put on immortality. It says this human nature will be swallowed up by a spiritual body. It says we'll have a body like Jesus Christ. We will be like him for we will see him as he is. There's so many different passages that describe this amazing event yet to happen. Uh, but then he goes on and tells us down in verse 42, 42, again, please forgive me for just picking a few verses. Watch therefore, watch means stay awake, stay on guard, be ready. The Son of God gave us all of this information that he says, watch therefore, make sure you're in tune, make sure you've got things in the right focus. What's the most important thing to you? Hopefully this bit of stuff he told us to watch for. Watch therefore. In the same verse, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. So nobody actually knows the actual time. Jesus himself said, oh, even the Son of Man doesn't know, only the Father knows. Okay, we're happy with that, but we've got enough general information to keep us on our toes, which makes sense, doesn't it? Down in verse 40, uh, uh, where are we? Verse 42, yes. We read that, verse 43. But know this, that if the goodman of the house or the, the owner of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Uh, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord shall make rule or over his household to give them their meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say to you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, be rough with the brothers and sisters, uh, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder. That's a really unpleasant description. It means to chop, we'd say in modern English, we'd say he'll chop him in pieces, physically chop him in pieces. He shall cut him in sunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And uh, chapter 25 goes on to the great uh, parables of watching out for the Lord's return. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I've used a fair bit of time up here. I've got to be careful. But there's so much information in this passage. And he, he finishes off the story by saying, so you be one of the ones that's on guard, watching out, making sure that you stay in tune with what the program is, uh, because you want to be ready for when the Lord comes. Uh, you want to be part of those that are raised up to meet the Lord in the air, because nobody actually knows when he's coming back. But the little tiny bit I want to pick out today is back in verse 43. So forgive me for you reading all of that, then going to verse 43. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Now, I, I hadn't noticed it before, but I, I noticed just this week there are also that there are actually seven references to the thief or the thief in the night, that concept. 
And seven in the Bible is a kind of a number identifying that it's God's seal or his stamp of approval. Uh, he's the guy that thought about this. And in Matthew 24 is perhaps the first one that we're looking at. And he says, I'm coming like a thief in the night. Now, modern translations will say, I'm going to come like a burglar unexpectedly. And uh, as I say, that is the modern expression. I, I thought, oh, burglar, okay. What's a burglar do that you don't sort of notice? Uh, burglars, of course, uh, Western Australia at the moment, I think last year we had about 23,500 burglaries. That's about one every two and a half hours, roughly. It's not too bad. It's actually dropped over the last four years. Did you know that? Burglaries have dropped in Western Australia. That's a residential and commercial. And uh, I'm thinking, why have burglaries dropped? They started to drop apparently about four years ago. I reckon it, the burglars started putting their money into cryptocurrency. <laughs> They're hoping for a good rise off that. They made a few bucks, got out just before it collapsed, and probably now they've taken up jobs as tradesmen and they're robbing us, <laughs> building houses at three bucks a brick. So anyway, burglars. Um, a couple of bits of information for you about burglary. I mean, I can remember when my place got burgled in, in Williton, 30 Macquarie Way, many, many years ago. I've only ever been burgled once, uh, although sometimes, anyway, I won't say that. but. This particular night, the dog woke barking furiously and, uh, and we heard all sorts of crashing and banging in the backyard, not in the house. And uh, I went out to have a look and I heard someone clambering over the fence and so forth. What had happened, the bur burglar had come in and didn't realise we had a dog. Woke the dog, because I've never ever put a sign up, see? Woke the dog and uh, she started barking and this, this burglar, I'd forgotten, I'd done something on the roof earlier that day and the crashing and banging turned out to be, I'd forgotten to put the ladder away, so I'd left it lying down on the ground. <laughs> and it was in a straight line towards the fence. So this guy has crashed and banged over the top of the ladder, tripping over all the steps of the ladder on his way out. I can imagine he would have donged himself. I mean, it's a wonder I didn't get sued. <laughs> Leaving your ladder out in a dangerous position. Anyway, so maybe you've been burglared, I haven't. It's someone you know, that had been burgled badly told me it's a very distressing experience, and I can certainly imagine that. Um, but it's funny because when the Bible uses the term the thief in the night or the thief coming and so on, it's making a simple point. And the first point in this little story here is it's unexpected. You know, you don't expect it. You know, you don't get a, you know, perhaps a, an official notification on your email. You know, I will be coming next Tuesday night at 3.30 in the morning. I'm not going to, you know, it's ridiculous, obviously. Clearly it's unexpected. Uh, the police tell us that it's not only unexpected, it's often when you're away. Most burglaries occur when you're away, and that's why they tell you to get your letters out of your letterbox and so on. Uh, they also tell us that uh, burglars won't actually be out burgling if it's bad weather. I mean, you, you, your best self-respecting burglar does not want to get all wet and drenching and come home looking like the cat dragged him in. He only goes out in good weather. Uh, the, uh, the police also tell us that uh, you're more likely to be burgled if your house looks well maintained. I think I'm pretty safe there. That's my best excuse ever for not cleaning the gutters or mowing the lawn. Honey, I don't want burglars here. So if you have well maintained, it means you've probably got someone, a contractor coming and got a bit more money. You're more likely to be burgled if you have a fancy car going in and out of your driveway. My 13-year-old Nissan is almost guaranteed to keep burglars away. Um, you're almost certain to be burgled, as I say, on holiday season. Uh, burglars these days watch your social media to check when you're going away. That sounds nasty, doesn't it? It sounds pretty horrid. Uh, you're more likely to be burgled if you have a glass front door or a glass panel next to your front door. You're less likely to be burgled if you have a home security system, which is obvious or video cameras, which are obvious, and a false video camera doesn't work. Uh, years ago, we put them up around the hall here. This hall's been burgled five times, I think, six, five or six, I've lost track. And we, we put false cameras out there and they just burgled the place anyway, you know, a month or so later. So false cameras don't work, but real ones do. Uh, and you're less likely to be burgled if you have a security door at the front or a dog. So there's your, there's helpfully, if you learn nothing else today, 
You learn what the police are currently recommending about how to avoid burglary. But in the Bible, what Jesus is saying is it's going to be unexpected. There's no announcement of this. It'll be in the time that you don't expect. You know, quite often people have this idea, oh, no, the world's starting to feel a bit safer. The world's starting to feel like it's getting better. We've just about cleared out COVID-19 now and, uh, uh, you know, there'll be undoubtedly a truce signed at some stage between, you know, Russia and uh, Ukraine, although that's not a very important one. The really important one is between Israel and all the Arab neighbours. And in fact, I don't know if you know, they've now signed five peace treaties with Arab neighbours and declaring peace and security as a consequence of that in that region. Uh, I mean, they have nowhere near signing up with all of them, so, so far so good. But what I'm trying to point out is, in, and Jesus is trying to point out is, all of these signs I give you, it actually won't give you the exact time at all. It'll simply give you an approximation. Over to the Gospel of, uh, actually no, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And I know I've read this one just recently in the context of another situation, but I will just read this for you because this is one of the seven. And what I noticed as I went through these seven references is that they all contain, uh, it's like looking at different sides of the same coin. Jesus comes back, but here's another sign to look at. Here's another side to look at. Here's another side. They're all different sides of the same coin. We all know 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 7, very famous. But the heavens and the earth, which are now are kept by the same word in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men or destruction of ungodly men. Uh, and uh, Peter points out to us the end of this world will come with some massive fiery outpouring. Uh, verse 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, would not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Uh, seeing then that all these things should be dissolved or melted, is the word in the Greek, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And the second reference to thief, thief in the night return of Jesus Christ or the burglar experience, it gives you the mechanics of it. Uh, a massive noise in heaven followed by all of the elements melting with intense heat. Uh, can you visualise something like that? I'm finding it hard to visualise, but I'm kind of getting a bit of an image here. And it does sound a bit like some sort of nuclear catastrophe, doesn't it? And that for the Christians, it says, seeing that, all, verse 11, all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And the, the, the outworking of this understanding is that Christians need to make sure they're living good lives. They're living lives focused on God and focused on his work. Uh, decent lives and so on. Let's quickly move to another one. I won't go to, uh, through all of these in details. Revelation 16. I'd often wondered about this one. Revelation 16. You'll have seen me do presentations and slideshows and Bible talks and what have you on all the different uh, six plagues or six vials in chapter 16 here, uh, which I'm not going to go through today. But I'm going to pick up the, uh, the, the last one here, down in verse 12. Uh, and the sixth angel uh, poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. Now, just quickly, the book of Revelation is a book given to us symbolically. It's got all sorts of strange symbols that you're meant to use other parts of the Bible to decode. Uh, and if you use other parts of the Bible to decode it, it does actually unfold reasonably straightforwardly. And I'm not going to say any more than that today. The sixth angel, in other words, the last massive time frame of earth before the seventh, which is the end, poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, the Euphrates here seemingly refers to the last great empire in the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire. The Ottoman Empire, after about half a millennia, 500 years or so, collapsed in World War I in 1918. 
when the British Army under General Allenby overran its position, and I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but it was, it was quite miraculous how it all just slotted into place. Uh, we read in uh, the same verse that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared in order for the end of the world to come, all the different countries to the east of Israel had to become independent from the Ottoman Empire and had to re-establish their various kingdoms. So you now have the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the kingdoms in the, you know, the United Arab Emirates, the Yemenis and so forth, Syrian uh, Jordanian king, the, uh, you know, the various other ones there, right through heading east. All they're ready because they're eventually destined to become the, the, the antagonists at the end of the age, which I'm not going to talk about now. So he says, the way of the kings of the east might be prepared, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And that a reasonable... Uh, a reasonable explanation for that, and again, I haven't got time to explain it, is that these refer to religions rather than political movements, religions. And the religions appear to be the religion of the false prophet, Islam, the beast, uh, Catholicism, and its descendants, which is nominal Christianity. And the final one is the dragon, which is the uh, chapter 12, the Zionist, Judaist type movement. So Jews, Christians, Muslims, why is that important? For these are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Is it possible that those three religions could actually be the source of the whole world joining together in a massive battle at the end of the age? And as you watch history and as you look around you, I think you'll find that's a suggestion that does make a bit of sense. Uh, verse 16, and he gathered them together into the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And okay, we all talk about Armageddon as the end of the world, so fair enough, I'm not going to criticise that. But Armageddon also has another meaning. And the meaning is that, back, people don't realise, but back in 1918, there was the final big battle in the Middle East that changed the powers of the Middle East. It was in uh, De September 1918, and it was General Allenby, British Commonwealth forces, defeating the Ottoman Empire at the Battle of the Hill of uh, Megiddo. Hill of Megiddo in the Hebrew and in the Greek, the hill of Megiddo is Armageddon. And that changed everything. Once he'd conquered the 7th and 8th armies, he went up and he conquered the 4th army, then it was just the end of the empire. It all changed. And uh, that, of course, marked the beginning of British control in the Middle East. It marked the beginning of the return of the Jews en masse. It then marks the beginning, effectively, of the State of Israel in 1948. Because once the Ottomans are conquered, it opens the whole thing up to a, effectively a vacuum, a, a vacuum of local uh, uh, politics and so on. Uh, anyway, that's another story for another day. So in verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty and great an earthquake. Uh, and the great city was divided into three parts. The great city here is probably Jerusalem. Is Jerusalem in three parts? Yeah, there's the Muslim quarter the Christian quarter and the Jewish quarter, in the, right in the centre of Jerusalem. And that seems to tie back in with the earlier passage there. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. That's a pretty big outpouring of the great battle of the day of God Almighty. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, so about 50 or 60 kilos. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail and the plague thereof was very great. It is over. That's the point. But shoehorn right in the middle of all of that. I didn't read it. But go back to verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Uh, jammed right in the middle of this whole bit of prophecy is this same thing about, I'll just warn you one more time. Jesus is talking here. I'll warn you one more time. Make sure that you're ready when the 
burglar comes. Uh, because that's what this is all about, being ready and awake. You would think, though, if we've just gone through that and if we've understood it correctly, that this all makes pretty much sense. It's a process which began back in 1917, flipped over in 1918, 1925, the end of the uh, Muslim caliphate and so forth, uh, then eventually sliding down through history. 1948, the State of Israel established and then the beginning of the end. Uh, you would think people would recognise that, but Jesus said, no, the whole way through, you're going to have to just be waiting as if the burglar hasn't quite arrived yet. You've got to be on your guard. You've got to be on your guard. You've got to be on your guard. Uh, and uh, what I like about that story is the fact that it's, it's kind of the end. This gives you information about the end of the world again. Uh, let's go to another one over in, um, oh, how am I going? 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm going to be struggling to get through these. 1 Thessalonians 5. I'll do a couple of them another night, maybe. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, what we find in Thessalonians 5 is we're given two references to the thief in the night, not just one. And we're given another metaphor as well, a pregnant woman and her delivery. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll ask you a question. Who knows what the longest pregnancy before a live delivery was? recorded in history. I mean, it's normally nine months, isn't it? You know, if they go a bit long, it's nine months and two weeks or so, isn't it? No. The longest one, you're not going to believe this, is just over a year. Imagine some lady, I mean, the baby had arrived three years old, sort of, you know. Imagine the lady having a baby at a year. One year, it's a lady called Beulah Hunter, 1945, well recorded. Uh, 375 days, that is one year and 10 days. Just astonishing, isn't it? The shortest, these are actually recent statistics, by the way, the shortest is 21 weeks and five days. At the moment, there are two children that survived, which is just astonishing, 21 weeks and five days. Um, that's just under five months. Very, very remarkable. You wouldn't want to shoot for that one. But anyway, back to the story. What are we talking about? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. Why? Because you know all about it. You guys are pretty good at this sort of stuff. You've been reading Bible prophecy. You've been listening to talks, watching slideshows, watching the news around about you. I don't like watching news anymore either. I've sort of personally given up watching news. The only stuff I kind of don't mind is kind of the geopolitics because that's Bible kind of news. But the rest of it's just making me upset at the moment. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. In other words, in early Christian circles, this was a common expression. You all know this. This is standard stuff. We talk about it all the time. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Uh, but you, brethren, are not in day that that day should overtake you as a thief. And again, we get the second reference in Thessalonians 5 here. Um, and what, again, Paul is pointing out to us here is that uh, they'll say peace and safety before the end. It won't be a matter of wars and plagues and famines and earthquakes. It'll be somebody announcing we've successfully reached peace and safety. Everything's going to be okay. The Jews and the Arabs are all getting on fine. The Christians and the Arabs are getting on fine. The Arabs and the Calathumpians, whoever's left, I can't remember now, they're all getting on fine as well. And they've all signed off on it. It's all good. Peace and security in our times. That rings a bell to anyone? Yeah, Chamberlain, World War II. Um, and, of course, the Bible says that's right. The very last sign is not wars. It's the reverse. It's everybody saying it's all sorted now. Uh, so you're given the last sign of the end of this earth just there in verse 2. But he goes on, verse 3 rather, he goes on though and he says, but that you are not in darkness, brethren, the day should take you as a thief in the night. Verse 5, you are all the children of the light, the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. A sober there, by the way, I might just point out, is, is the Greek word napho. It means to be to not imbibe in alcohol. That's literally what it means, to not drink alcohol, um, to be sober. We, we know that's what sober means, but most people presume when they read it in the New Testament, it's kind of the, you know, sensible, 
kind of expression of sober or down to earth or realistic or practical or, you know, self-controlled. That's all true as well, but the actual word means not drinking alcohol, for those who are interested in that. Anyway, uh, verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken or are drinking are drunken in the night. Uh, So that sort of adds a little more weight to the understanding of sober there because he immediately makes the draws the distinction between those that are sober, us, we're daytime people, versus nighttime people who get up to mischief and start to get drunk. In verse 8, let us therefore who are of the day be sober, same word in the Greek, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, hallelujah, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when all this starts to break out around the world, the Bible teaches us that we're not to fear, we're not to be worried. Our redemption draweth nigh, Jesus told us in another place there. So in this passage, just pointing out to you that the thief in the night thing is actually linked here with an announcement of peace and safety or some announcements of international peace and security being allegedly achieved, which we sort of know about. Let's go to another one. Oh, why was I talking about childbirth? It was because back in verse 3 it says, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And what, what struck me about that is that's almost the opposite to the thief metaphor. The thief is absolutely unknown. I mean, with a thief, you don't know whether it's going to be you know, a burglar tonight or in 15 years' time. It could happen any time or 500 years' time for that matter. But with with delivery, child delivery, in theory, that's pretty straightforward. It's nine months. I mean, I've had children. I know all about this, four of them. I know what it's like. I've been there. I've done that. I have the little marks in my hand. Anyway, and of course, what the Lord is saying here is that on one hand, it's got an open-ended possibility, but on the other hand, theoretically, it should, you would imagine, you've got a reasonable prospect of predicting it, a reasonable prospect, making allowance for the fact that some woman in America had a one year and 10 day delivery, and other women have, a, have managed, astonishingly, to have a 21 week and five day delivery and survive. And of course, what this is reminding us, yes, that's true. You've got a window of what it's going to look like, as well as you need to have the feeling it could happen absolutely any time, like a thief in the night. So there's both given in this little story here. Over to uh, another passage, over in Revelation chapter 3. How are we going to have time? Yes, quickly. Revelation 3, if you will. We've actually got two more after this, so we might try and burn through this one. But Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, and by the way, if I said to you, which church do you reckon has this uh, grave warning about the thief in the night in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the, the, the seven famous churches, which one would you have guessed? I know which one I would have guessed. I would have guessed Laodicea. I would have thought Laodicea is the one that's got this thing about, you know, you're, you're, you're lazy and you're, you're too rich now and you're blind and you're poor and you're naked and so on. Actually, it's not. It's Sardis, which is uh, this one here. Uh, to the Sardis, right, these things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know the works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, therefore, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect or complete or full before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I'll come back on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. But thou hast a few names there in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And it's a it's a it's a description, it's quite an indictment here on this Sardis church. Now This was once a physical church 2,000 years ago, but it's also meant to give us uh, a bit of how Jesus feels towards modern churches in 2022. There will be churches who, who look like they're alive, but actually they're dead. Now, I suppose you could say, well, perhaps that's like the local traditional church on the corner. Looks like it's alive, but it's actually dead. 
possibly, but that's not even actually technically a church because they're not spirit-filled in most cases. Okay, move from there to the next category, which is Pentecostal churches, which look like they're alive but are dead. And now don't get me wrong, we've also got to make sure we never fall into this category, but that's Jesus' warning. And uh, the word alive here actually it means in the Greek, lively, active. They look like they're lively, but actually they're dead. There are many Pentecostal churches where, you know, uh, I, I, think, I think the first time I ever saw a mosh pit was at a church meeting. You're thinking, what's that? Some of us older ones may not know what that means. It means a, like traditionally a dance square. Okay, so there's a dance area down the front. I'm looking at one or two of the older people here. And uh, there's a dance area down the front. The church congregants are out the back there somewhere. And maybe all the young people have come out the front. The band is jamming away in the front there. And uh, everybody's down the front dancing and what have you. And I hope no one ever takes a clip of that, by the way. But anyway, they're down the front there dancing and jigging away and what have you. And uh, looks lively. But nine times out of ten you talk to them and they've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. They are still dead in trespass and sin, and all the people said. And sadly, I mean, there was a recent big Pentecostal church in the Eastern States that's uh, pretty much imploded as a consequence of almost this exact description. Uh, looks alive and looks active and, uh, you know, very famous world-class singers and uh, a world-class band and uh, not pyrotechnics, but what do you call it? You know, all the lighting and the stage and the the atmosphere and so on, and lights going off and on. Who's been to the Optus Stadium? What do you call that, all those lights and things happening? I don't know. Either. Lights. Okay, thank you. <laughs> who, need, who needs friends? <laughs> lights, yes. You know what I'm trying to describe, though. Very, very uh, m modern and theatrical and what have you, and that all looks good. What is it? Laser lighting, maybe? Yeah, I'm not sure. Whatever it is. And of course, what Jesus says here, that's right, you've got, a, you've got a reputation. The word name means reputation. You've got a reputation that you're lively, but actually you're all dead. You've never been filled with the Holy Ghost. Finding the Lord and being filled with the Holy Ghost is that process which makes you alive. The Scriptures talk about receiving the spirit of life. If the same spirit that dwells in you dwells in Christ, raised Christ from the dead, he shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And sadly, tragically, uh, this does become a trap for Pentecostal type churches, charismatic churches. Remember therefore, whence thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I'll come on thee. Thou hast a few names in Sardis and so on. He that overcometh in verse 5, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All the people said. That's what we want. That's all we want. That bit there at the end, verse 6. Jesus confessing our name before the Holy Father and the angels. Thank you, Lord. We're in tune with this. We're on guard. We're watching out. Over again, if you will, just Luke chapter 12. Yes. Luke chapter 12. I might be able to squeeze these two in. Luke chapter 12. What I love about this one is it's the reward that's attached to it. The ones we looked through so far today, the first five, one, the first one reminds us how unexpected it is. The second one reminds us of a, a fiery end of the world. The third one reminded us of a great battle and the end that was coming. The fourth one just now, reminded us of peace and security being declared in Thessalonians. The fifth one we just read, of course, reminded us of the, uh, uh, what did I say? Yes, a warning to the church, a warning to the church. In other words, another side of the same coin is there is a warning to the church to stay on top of the world. Don't let the world drag you in. Don't become enticed by it. Uh, become dead to the Lord. Over again, if you will, as I say, Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 43, I'm not going to read all of these, but Luke, verse 43, um, very similar to Matthew 24, slightly different. Verse 43, blessed is he that servant whom the Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. I tell you of a truth, I'll, I will say unto you that I'll make him ruler over all that he has. Uh, the actual verse, though, is back in yeah, verse, hang on a second. 
in trying to shorten this up, I've omitted the verse about the thief. Thirty-nine, is it? Thank you. And know this, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken up or broken through or broken into. Be ye therefore ready also, verse 40, for the Son of Man comes at an hour that you think not. Uh, down to verse uh, 42. Uh, and the Lord said, Who then is a faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion and beat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a, of a truth, I tell you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. And I love that because uh, this is the, the, the thief reference that actually says, by the way, this, Jesus coming back unexpectedly, which is what this is all about, is also the, the signal and the kickoff for your everlasting reward. And all the people said, to be raised up to be like him and to rule over all that he has. It says we're going to be kings and priests in the next age. It talks about us sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It talks about us uh, judging the Gentile nations and uh, chastising them with a rod of iron. It talks about us ruling through that thousand-year period. It talks about us ruling into the future. And uh, I love the way that Jesus puts it here. It's, it's part of that's the signal you're going to rule forever. What a wonderful reward that is. Um, where are we going? Acts chapter 2, just to finish up. No, we've covered them, all, covered them all now, but Acts chapter 2. Some, I guess the, uh, the verse here perhaps just... This has nothing to do with the thief in that sense, but it's a verse that summarises how to find the Lord, how to follow God. Acts chapter 2, just for our final verse here today, a group of people asked Peter the Apostle, the famous Apostle, how to find God. And I do like the way that he replies, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the Apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises to you and your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he did testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. And today, if you want to save yourself from not being ready for Jesus returning to earth like a thief, in the night, as we read seven times there, then you need to repent, be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the Holy Ghost. That's how you save yourself. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. We'll leave those few thoughts there. I'm sorry I've gone a bit over time there. My apologies.